the topic for tonight by our uh, adjunct professor, Dr. Richard Hill, on my left here. The title is Against Despair <coughs> and Inertia. The stories we need to guide us to a better future. Powerful topic. We are in a critical moment of political volatility at the moment, as I'm sure everyone's aware. We're faced with a range of acute, intersecting crises, and we have some stark choices to make about the sort of world we want to live in. If we care about the future, there is no avoiding our moral responsibility in being part of a global society movement tasked with transforming the current order of things. The challenging facing justice-orientated progressives is to tell a persuasive story about what it means to be human in a complex, interconnected world and how justice, peace and regeneration can be achieved. There are things we can do right now, today, to help bring about the changes that we so desperately need. And tonight we have Richard here to perhaps give us some clues on how to do that and what we can actually do in a practical way. So Richard is the adjunct professor in the School of Human Services and Social Work at Griffith University on the Gold Coast. He's also an honorary associate of the University of Sydney, and he is the convener and let's say inventor and powerful force behind Nagara Institute. Very important man in our Mullumbimby area. Richard's publications are many and varied, and he has two on universities. One is called Selling Students Short, Why You Won't Get the University Education You Deserve. And the second is called Wackademia, an insider's account of the troubled university. <laughs> That's just two of his books. He's written nine other books on various inspiring range of topics with various other authors. And one of them is called Surviving Care Towards Redress and Healing for the Forgotten Australians. Very important topic. Another one is called Violations of Trust, How Social and Welfare Institutions Fail Children. A third one, Erasing Iraq, the human consequences of human carnage. Number six, International Criminology. Number seven, Discovering Risk. Number eight, Hard Lessons, Reflections on Crime Control in Late Modernity. Book number nine, Families, Crime and Juvenile Crime. Ten, Youth, Crime and the Media, and the last book, Ways of Resistance, Young People and Social Control in Australia. Um, and at the moment he's just completed his 12th book with two other authors called The Sacking of Fallujah, A People's History, and that will be published next year. So you can see what a vast range of topics uh, Richard is interested in and actually has mastered and so I feel like that is a so many academics these days seem to get very one pointed and, and you know really just focused only on their particular subject but Richard is so broad and he's a very broad personality altogether. <laughs> so, um, also I should just say that in the last few years he's written extensively on Australia higher education for the Australian camp the Australian the Campus Review, New Matilda, Arena Magazine, The Advocate, Social Alternatives, University World News, The Conversation, Overland, Online. He's so busy, I don't know how he has time to come tonight. So please give Richard a very, very warm <laughs> round of applause. I'm, we're very touched at Nagara that you would use our logo and work with us to, to set up what is a really, really important event. Um, somebody once said at one of the Nagar events in Mullumbimby that uh, and she was reflecting on the 180 people that we had on one of our first events and she said this in itself is in opposition to neoliberalism 
Yes, because neoliberalism, which I'll talk about later, is a worldview that actually wants us all to be in competition with each other. They don't want people speaking with each other. They certainly don't want people in groups debating controversial ideas. Um, so simply being in this room together, you're acting in opposition to a worldview. So congratulations on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit embarrassed by the title of this. I, I read it and I thought, God, I sound like one of those you know, Bible bashes from the pulpit. <laughs> you know, uh, that you have failed your duty in, um, you know, in being inert or, dis or, or that you've despaired, you know. I mean, look, quite frankly, um, last week when I read the summary of the IPCC report, um, I virtually choked on my cornflakes in the morning, you know. And, and what got me really riled, and I knew I shouldn't have done it, I actually went and bought a copy of The Australian because I was so intrigued as, as to what these people might say about one of the most catastrophic reports oh, to be released. And it's good to know the microphone works. It's good to know the microphone works in another room. It does work. Yeah. Shall I wait or go on? Yeah, it's coming through the um, ceiling, which is great. Does it? Just need the mic. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll just finish this story off. I'll just finish this story off, if I may, with your indulgence. <laughs> um, I, I actually read um, yeah, look, my least favourite journalist of all time, uh, and I'd like your reaction to this, is Judith Sloan. <laughs> now, now, much to my horror, I, I then discovered, not only was she a journalist for Australian, but she's actually an academic at yes. Monash University. No, uh, Flinders. Is it Flinders? Professor. Well, even worse. Yeah, even worse. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, and, and, and I read this piece on the front page of The Australian, which, as you know, is not the impartial newspaper it claims to be. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you all, but in fact it, it is quite a, um, a skewed publication that, that has real problems with climate change. And Judith Sloan wrote this scurrilous piece which essentially attacked the climate change scientists on a highly personal level, discredited the science, said it's all made up, they're all part of an international conspiracy, um, and paid no regard to the enormous consequences that we are now facing. Here comes the mic. <laughs> I, I gathered that. <laughs> Once here comes the mic, you'll be fine. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. It's good. It's good. Turn it on. It is on. Turn it on. Hello? 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 I might go and turn it down. Let's take another look at it. This is like a Monty Python sketch. Isn't it? <laughs> 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 it's the alien. <laughs> uh. <laughs> They're up there. What's that one? It's the point, point of the speaker of Matthew. It's really only a roll clock. <laughs> I think they've mastered it. Okay. Okay. Um, I yeah, well, I was, where was I? With Judith Sloan, my least favourite journalist. Um, now, um, I think there should be an award for Judith Sloan. And um, I, I remember a few years back, we actually had um, um, a, a sort of a trial for um, John Howard in, in, uh, when I lived in Bellingen. And 300 people turned up for this trial, and it was a people's trial, and we found John Howard guilty of crimes of, against humanity, particularly uh, for presiding over the Iraq war. And the, the jury actually decided that the appropriate crime for him would be to live in Bellingen for the rest of his days. Uh, and so I would like to condemn um, uh, Judith Sloan to live in Mullumbimby, actually, for the rest of the day. Okay. Yeah, so look, I read the IPCC... I read the IPCC report. Uh, you, would, you know the, the, the findings there. I won't repeat them. Um, to say they're worrying is an understatement. Uh, the IPCC report itself, as you know, is always on the modest side. Um, they're very cautious, almost hyper-cautious, because of the political atmosphere within which they're operating. Um, Judith Sloan, as I say, went on to... Judith Sloan went on to discredit the science and the scientists concerned, which I thought was dreadful. So why wouldn't we despair? You know, if, if the window of opportunity for dealing with climate change is 
2050, according to uh, the IPCC, I think they're being very generous, um, then why wouldn't we despair? Why wouldn't you head for the red bottle of wine as I do on frequent occasions when you read, when you read reports by Judith Sloan and her cronies? Um, despair, despair is one reaction. Despair is one reaction. It's understandable. Is it always helpful and useful? Well, yes and no. I mean, people can move on from despair. It's a bit like complaint. Complaint's a good thing. Um, social change starts with complaint, but we have to go beyond complaint. We have to organize, we have to be focused, and we have to be strategic and political. <coughs> so that was a bad week last week, a really bad week. Um, and I've written to Judith Sloan complaining that she ruined my week. Uh, <laughs> she, she hasn't written back. Um, um, but you know, a number of other things happened that week where my spirits went from zero to about 95. Um, one of them was something that happened in the state of Bavaria. Have you heard about this? Yeah. In the state of Bavaria, which as you know is one of the most conservative states in, uh, in Germany, they had a state election. And all the expectations were that the far right in Germany would sweep away with those state elections. Mainly because of the so-called refugee crisis. Uh, the, the flow of migrants into the country and so forth. And you've seen all the problems occurring in Germany as a result. Um, but the complete opposite happened. The Greens actually doubled their vote. They got 17 plus percent. And the more interesting and intriguing thing is that the votes actually didn't come from people in the mid-left or soft-left or whatever you want to call it. The votes came from the right of the political spectrum. So these were people who had made a decision that the policies presented to them by this party were appealing, attractive and decent. And, and they, so they went with the Green Party and as I say, an unprecedented vote. And uh, now the Greens Party in Germany, in Bavaria, is the second most powerful party and it's nationally the most powerful party, having huge reverberations around the country and around Europe. The other thing that happened, um, the Dutch Appeals Court um, upheld a, court, a legal order um, which has directed the Dutch government to preside over um, a much higher level of cuts in emissions. Now this is a staggering judgment uh, by any measure. In fact, the, the nature of the judgment, from what I understand, is that they are required to cut in one year more than they've cut in emissions since 1991. Fantastic. And that includes the, the closure of coal-fired power stations and the government now is on notice to actually take this action. Governments around Europe uh, are watching this, governments in Africa are watching this and governments in a Asia are watching this. So it's a case of really watch this space for these sorts of developments which are happening. The other thing which my colleague over here um, Liz Elliott passed on to me today another judgment by the US Supreme Court against a company that was basically peddling and promoting um, lead paint. Um, they were found guilty of that, so they were complicit in causing Ill, Ill health to a number of people. Um, a $400 million fine, the US, was imposed. The companies the concerned took the action to the Supreme Court to appeal and the court didn't even consider the appeal. So what this means in America and beyond is that these corporations now are on notice, as they should be, for their contribution to, um, to climate pollution. So what we're seeing then is so are some positive signs occurring. The other signs, of course, are the ones we all well know. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn in England, um, operating on a very radical agenda. Uh, and what was interesting about Jeremy Corbyn, and Liz is very familiar, as we all are with this, is that when he first went to opposition, the Murdoch press went into overdrive. They portrayed, it, portrayed him as irresponsible, that if he ever got his, his hands on the reins of power, that the economy would go down to gurgler, it would be the end of Britain as we know it, um, and the communists uh, would be taking over, the Reds would be un not under the bed, they'd be in the bed. Um, but you know, um, none of this has actually happened, and when, when Corbyn had the opportunity, and, and bear in mind, it's a bit like Australia, that the Murdoch press has an enormous power in the UK, just as it ha has here. In fact, in Queensland, he's got a monopoly. Um, and when people heard 
the messages and the policies of renationalizing the railways, free education, a whole raft of other, uh, other uh, um, progressive policies, people thought, well, actually, I agree with this guy. And the more exposure he got, and he was, getting, he was like a rock star, wasn't he? I mean, he was going to stadiums and appearing at various venues. And if the message gets out there, the time is right. Because what's happening across democracies um, is that there's a huge disillusionment with politicians and democratic institutions. And there's a greater preparedness of people to vote for independence and, uh, and other parties. But if a coherent alternative message is put out there, and if that dirty word is mentioned, socialism, people seem to, to actually be drawn to it again, which is very interesting. Um, the other, thing, the other phenomenon, of course, we saw was Bernie Sanders in the United States. And this guy, this guy explicitly referred to a return to socialism and to the basic underlying values of socialism and, and caring for other people in our community, building a society based on the common good, cooperation, caring and sharing and the rest of it. That resonated with people. So the lessons from this are if we tell a good story, if we say that the lives which people are leading now, the lives grounded in inequality, grounded in the stress and pressures of everyday life, grounded in enormous amounts of debt, grounded in wage stagnation and, 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 and an unprecedented period thereof, people will listen to those alternative messages. There is, as Joanna Macy um, has stated, some kind of major occurrence happening. There's, if not a great awakening, there is a great turning happening. I really believe that, and I'll argue the case for that later. What we need, though, is not a naive hope. We can't just hope for something. We can't say, well, I'm not going to despair, but I'm going to hope for good. I mean, that doesn't get us very far. What we actually need is engaged hope, a practice which takes us into the world of activ activism, and not simply an activism that's about oppositional politics or protesting about the powerful, but something that is lived through our everyday lives and also expressed through our political activities as well. Terry Eagleton, the, the literary theorist, the great literary theorist from, from uh, England, has actually said, not being jolly does not imply despair. It is a realistic acknowledgement of the world as it is. And the world as it is, is a worrying place. Okay, I just want to tell you a very, very brief story, if I may. Um, about 10 days ago, I went to a conference, to the National Tertiary Education Union Conference, and I was invited to speak there. Um, I've always wondered why people ever invite me to speak. But anyway, there I was, you know, I probably turned up because I paid for my hotel, which is great. But um, I, went, I went there, and the, the title of the conference was The Future of the Sector. And now, um, I, over the last three or four years or so, I've been thinking a lot about this thing called the future. I know there's many people in this room, you probably believe, well, the future doesn't actually exist, you know, or it's a kind of construction or it's a figment of our imaginations. Um, let's call it the world of tomorrow then. Let's, let's be a bit more comfortable with that. The world of tomorrow, I mean, there is one. You know, well, for now, there's one. Um, but this conference went on for a day and a half, and after a day and a half, look, and I understand, I understand its primary concern as a union is industrial relations. I get that, I get that. But to, to have a conference which proceeded for a day and a half where the future wasn't even talked about or, or problematised, where there was no discussion of climate change, inequality, of all the great problems we're now facing, I found that absolutely staggering. Uh, and on the second day, I sort of stood up and I ripped up all my prepared notes <laughs> and I went off about the future. My first comment was, well, everybody, this is, the way it is, is that there are many people around the world who haven't got a future, actually. They're losing their homelands. You know, there are millions of people on the move and there'll be millions more coming knocking on our doors in the future uh, with the way climate change is going. So let's put this context, this university discussion into some kind of context. Let's talk about the world as we're living and experiencing it currently. Let's not talk about the future as an abstraction. Let's, it has to be grounded in what we're living today. Look, there are three types of future, three types of worlds of tomorrow. Um, there's the status quo, and uh, the, the status quo today, by and large, is a kind of near, is de defined within the parameters of neoliberal ideology. Um, I'm going to talk about that at the moment. So when, when you go to com conferences commonly, um, talking about the future, particularly if they're neoliberal conferences, <laughs> what they'll actually do, they'll talk about, oh, well, the jobs of the future, you know, new industry, uh, economic growth, productivity, all those really 
boring subjects that you get. You know, not bereft of imagination, bereft of any kind of alternative vision, and disregarding all the problems generated by this worldview. The second version of, 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 tomorrow, of tomorrow are what um, that crazy old war horse, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, you remember him? Yeah. Uh, what he called the known unknowns. Remember that famous phrase? I thought it was, I thought it was his better moment, actually. You know, I mean, apart from causing catastrophe in the Middle East, he was brilliant, you know. Um, and um, anyway, he. Um, yeah, he referred to the known unknowns, and it's, actually, people when they first heard this, they thought, "Is this guy crazy?" Which we clearly was. But um, <laughs> but but the, but the known the known unknowns was actually a very interesting sense of uncertainty about we know something is going to happen but we don't quite know what it is I mean it sounds like the basis of acute anxiety disorder which it probably is but there is this sense that we don't know what the wicked problems are we don't know what's going to emerge in the future and look one thing we do know one thing we do know and I, I, I suspect everybody in this room who believes in climate change the climate change is real happening present and a danger okay we all believe in it vast majority so um, if you're like me and you go for your lovely walks on the beach we're not far from the beach here we live, live near some of the best beaches in the world you walk on the beach you have a look around and it's beautiful but I don't feel like me, but I now look at the ocean and I see it as menacing. I see it as menacing and wonderful. And, and I, I think about the creatures under the surface, how they're going to suffer into the future. And I think, I look at this thing that I used to love with a passion, coming from an industrial city in England where I never saw the sea, to come to Australia and look at the ocean. I have enormous passion for it. I'm scared of it. Uh, and I, but I'm really scared of it now. I'm terrified of it, of what it, what it might do to us. And, and I'm sorry to say that places like Lismore, places like Mullumbimby, places like Byron, the entire Gold Coast, according to the IPCC, are facing imminent threats as a result of climate change. So these are part of the unknowns, and the known unknowns. We don't quite know how all this is going to turn out. The third kind of engagement with the idea of the future is a reimagining, and that's really what I'm totally interested in, is how can we now begin to think more creatively and expansively about the type of future they want to live in. And I'm talking here not simply about a, a rosy future which we might find desirable, but I'm talking one that's survivable. Because whatever else climate change is, it is a direct existential threat to us all, to all species on Earth, to, to, all, to all the ecosystems on Earth. It's a direct threat. Now, if you think that's kind of mumbo jumbo, I can't remember the name of the author, but there's a book called Extinctions. Um, and I think there's been six or seven major extinctions in human history going back, you know, right to the dawn of the earth. And I, I understand that between five and six of those have been a result of major climate change catastrophes. So this is not unprecedented. The difference, of course, is that we are the agents of what's currently happening. And we are the accelerators of, a, uh, of this process. Let me just go back, if I may, and, um, to... Um, to the status quo, to, to this sense of the, the, the future as, as it's often talked about in Australia and beyond. The future based on those usual things of economic growth, productivity and so forth. I'll just give you a very, a very brief summary of neoliberalism. For those people, who's, who's heard of neoliberalism? Okay, what, okay, good. What you have to know then, it, it is the most pernicious, violent, extreme, greedy, rapacious, nasty, self-destructive <laughs> worldview that you can imagine. Um, and it's had terrible consequences. It originated, I would put it, uh, around 1947, um, all presided over by the likes of Frederick Hayek, um, Milton Friedman, yes. and surprisingly enough, Karl Popper, um, at a Mont Mont Pellerin Society meeting in 1947 held in Switzerland. And that was the point at which this project began. And we're experiencing the end results of that now in 2018. Um, the intention of that meeting was crystal clear. It was crystal clear. Don't, don't, don't listen to me about this. Look it up on the net. The intention was no, nothing more or less than a takeover, an ideological takeover of the Western world and a return to free market economics of the most fundamentalist kind. One of its most um, vocal exponents, of course, was Ronald Reagan in the United States and Margaret Thatcher. And this, this, this comment 
is one which are, sticks right out. And when I read, I always reread and I think, what, what is this saying? Just think about what she said. This is what Margaret Thatcher said to the Sunday Times in 1981. She said, economics, economics are the method. Economics are the method. The object is to change the heart and soul. Now think about that for a second. So my argument has been, and I argue, argue with my colleagues about this, that neoliberalism was always, always more than an economic project. It was an attempt to alter the way we think about ourselves, our families, our communities, our neighbourhoods, our society. It was a project which was funded by some of the, the most powerful billionaires in, in, in the United States and in Britain and in other Western countries. Don't take my word for this. If there's one book you have to read uh, to tell you everything you need to know about neoliberalism and its historical origins, read Jane Mayer's Dark Money. It's, a, it's an amazing book and it will, it will catalogue the development of this ideology. It was purposeful, strategic, focused and intentioned on ensuring the ascendancy of free market economics in the Western world in particular. So we have this thing called neoliberalism. Essentially, what is it about? Milton Friedman argued that the market should prevail over any anything. That governments were essentially hazardous to public health. That what we actually need is the market to dictate a spontaneous order. If you leave things to the market, it will all work out. Small government meant the selling off of public services, it meant privatisation, it meant growing competitiveness between businesses, it meant a very cosy relationship between corporations and government, and it meant, in terms of acquiring the heart and soul of people, a new body of what um, Johan Hari calls neoliberal junk values. Most, at, at its heart, individualism. So when Margaret Thatcher said there are no, there's no such thing as society, she meant it. She said there are only individuals, that are, you, you basically look after your family, look after yourself, and you climb the greasy pole and bugger everybody else. That was the prevailing message. So it was, in my view, violent and dehumanising. If you want one little example of that, who saw the Four Corners programme on aged care? That is neoliberalism in action. The, the privileging of profit over everything else, right down to cutting the amount of chicken given to the elderly, right down to cutting the services for the elderly in those homes, right down to making sure that the front of all these homes are beautifully presented with beautiful um, plants and the rest of it. It's the culture of delusion and appearance. The real intention is profit. Um, I'm not saying that everybody in those centres is about profit. There are amazing people who work in those centres, but that seems to be a driving motive with all its consequences. Look, I'm just going to rattle off. You've all got your own list. Um, the crises and the challenges which we faced in 2018 in the world in which we live. The financial crisis. I'm told reliably by many of my uh, more economically literate friends that we're heading for another calamity which will make 2008 look like a tea party. Um, we have the outcome of the real, recent Royal, Royal Commission and the report handed down by Kenneth Hayne, which basically said what we all know, that banks are greedy and nasty, um, and they rip off the dead. Um, <laughs> we have the economic crisis, uh, an unprecedented, um, not unprecedented quite, we'd have to go back a hundred years, uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, in his book um, Capital in the 21st Century points out that we now have levels of economic inequality in Australia equivalent to a hundred years ago. We have the climate ecological crisis which we've already talked about. We have the political crisis, the diminishment of trust in our basic, in most basic institutions, the collapse of any uh, confidence, of a lot of confidence in our politicians. As I said earlier, the preparedness of voters to vote for various nefarious and odd, occasionally oddball figures. Um, I won't mention Pauline Hanson in that. Um, we have a crisis of government, of governance around the world. A crisis orchestrated by the encroachment of corporations into every aspect of our life. Um, I think Tim Hollow referred wonderfully to the divine right of corporations as if corporations should be privileged amongst everything else. 
Um, we now see the disputes happening over the TPP and the incredible powers afforded to corporations in terms of their activities. We have lobbyists whose sole job it is. There is something in America, there are 15,000 uh, lobbyists uh, on huge six-figure salaries living in around Washington, D.C., whose sole job is to actually get into the ear of politicians. We have 5,000 here in, in Canberra alone. Again, people on six-figure salaries getting in and out of the ears of various politicians. This is an assault on democracy itself. It's an assault on democracy. An excessive, an excessive incursion an excessive incursion into our democratic system that, that should be done away with. We have a growing social disconnection. We have various people talking about epidemics of loneliness, isolation, anxiety. We have a crisis around what's called an epistemic crisis, the crisis around knowledge, around what do we need to know what we know when we have a corporate media and a politician in the United States that talks about constantly about fake news where we don't actually know what are the credible sources. Certainly mainstream media are now almost entirely have lost credibility. Um, people now are going to alternative sites to get to try and find out what information they need to know about what, whatever's occurring. We also have the, the great challenge of technology. The great challenge of technology with all its promise with all the wonders of contemporary technology, with all the advantages of technology, but also the dark sides, the terrible dark sides of those technologies too. The evidence which is coming out now about the negative impacts of social media, uh, the spectre of robotics and artificial intelligence, and the great warning from Stephen Hawking about, about those particular developments. I think technology does hold a great promise. Um, friends of mine in this room, I know, argue that it may be the harbinger of a new wonderful life, but it may also be the harbinger of a new dystopian reality. Okay. I think, in short, I think, in terms of mainstream politics in Australia, I think we're stuck. We're stuck. There's a stuckness. We're, it's, like, it's, it's like we're in, a, in quicksand. I mean, if you see the machinations over Wentworth, what more, what more do you need to know? You know, it's like watching the Keystone Cops in action, isn't it? I mean, it's pathetic what's going on. Um, we've got politicians located somewhere in the late 19th century, if you're lucky. Uh, Scott Morrison's more in the 1950s. You know. uh, they've got no vision for the future other than the status quo and other than ensuring that the rich and powerful remain such. There's no compelling narrative about how to fix the problems we're addressing, particularly when it comes to climate change. There is no coherent energy policy anywhere, and there hasn't been a bipartisan agreement now for about a decade or more in the face of this crisis we're facing. There's no forward-looking. It is, in, in essence, business as usual of, of, um, as far as the mainstream is concerned. And look, I want to live in an Australia of which I can be proud. We all do. We all care. One of the worst things we're confronting, of course, is the spectre of refugees in concentration camps on remote islands. Um, and this is to the lasting shame of Australia. But it's not the only, it's not the only form of shame. We, we rank among the world's worst on a whole range of indices. We have some of the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions. We have high levels of natural gas, iron and iron ore exports. We're the biggest coal exporter around the world, go and figure. We have a new coal mine being proposed in the Adani in North Queensland, the awful Adani mine, um, as well as um, the expansion of underground mines in the Hunter Valley. We have land clearing and deforestation on a catastrophic level in New South Wales and equally so, maybe more so, in Queensland. We have the extinction of species on a, on, on a globally world record and we have our biodiversity being trashed. The coral reef is damaged, probably beyond repair, despite the, the great do dollop of money handed out to that foundation recently. Um, you know, what, what I don't understand about this, or maybe I do, maybe it's too simple, um, is that um, if you don't deal with global warming and if you keep pumping out coal into the atmosphere this is going to 
heat up the water, which is going to damage the reef. I mean, the government finds that a bit difficult to understand. I mean, I don't think if we do. Um, we have the, one of the cruelest asylum seeker policies on the planet. Uh, cruel, degrading torture of people in those camps. Absolutely, totally morally unacceptable, absolutely in breach of the relevant um, um, UN protocols um, and so forth. We've had unprecedented cuts to foreign aid, which whatever your views about foreign aid, and we can all argue about it, it's had real damage, damaging effects on some of the poorest communities in the world to, to, buttress, to buttress the interests of one of the richest nations on earth. And we're like toadies with America. We follow America into wars everywhere we go. And we've, we've, we've contributed and wrecked the Middle East. We've contributed terrible suffering in that part of the world. It's a national disgrace. Henry Reynolds was down uh, talking to us about this uh, on the basis of his book, Unnecessary Wars. We've caused terrible suffering around the world and we will continue to do so. Um, most recently, of course, in, uh, um, in relation to Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And we still have some of the most impoverished indigenous people in the world living in what used to be called third world conditions, in terrible conditions, and that is enduring. And we have the highest, one of the highest levels, maybe the highest levels of household debt in the world. These are major points of shame for our country, a country that we want to be proud of, a country where we want to go, wherever we go on holiday, that we want to say, I'm proud to be Australian. It's, it's carrying the torch on, on some issues. It's uh, progressive, but I'm afraid it isn't. It's located somewhere currently in the 19th century, maybe a lot, lot earlier. Um, but on the more positive side, there is a emergent story. Um, and I'm fascinated with this story. Um, there's a body of literature. Um, there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world. Um, Paul Hawking um, estimates that there are over a billion people who are in various ways associated with the environmental justice movement. But we have a body of literature emerging, which is fascinating, reflecting the interests and views of people in this country and beyond. George Monbiot, George Monbiot's book, Out of the Wreckage. Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics, Paul Mason's book, Post-Capitalism, Rutgers Bregman's book, Utopia for Realists, um, Naomi Klein's book, No is Not Enough, um, all, all of Charles Einstein's work, Eisenstein's work, excellent material. But what these are expressing are some of the thoughts and ideas about how we can get ourselves out of the mess that we're in. So what, what are these people actually suggesting? Well, the fundamental assumptions which are articulated, I think, most clearly by George Monbiot are about what it means to be human in a, in a complex, interconnected world. Um, where are we at our best and where are we at our worst? Well, we're at our worst when we compete each other to try and get up the greasy pole. Uh, that often produces res results which are not always flattering to, to the human species. George Monbiot and others insist, and they have, a, they have a basis for this argument, that we're essentially altruistic, we care about the well-being of others, that we are social creatures, we need other people in our lives to fulfill a whole number of um, things. That coexistence and connection are vital to our well-being and to our spiritual health. And we are at our best as human beings when we collaborate, when we share, and we give and care. There have been many, many other authors who have actually come up with a, the reimagining lists, a whole raft of lists, which I've actually produced as well. About the, and you should do it yourself. It's all fun. You know, what are the things you think we should be doing to actually make this world a better place? What can I do? What can other people do? What can we do in concert to make this world a better place? Um, Russell Brand, Hugh McKay, Joanna Macy, Naomi Klein, all these people are producing great reams of lists about what we should be doing. Let me just talk about two examples of where we might go, and I'd recommend you all read these. Um, the first is the Leap Manifesto. Who's heard of that? The Leap Manifesto. You can get it on, you can see it on Google. Um, it's a remarkable ac accomplishment. The Leap Manifesto was published by a group of activists in Canada. The instigators for it, but not the only ones, were Naomi Klein and her partner, Arvi Cohen. And what they sought to do 
was to get, I, I believe it was in the order of about 160, now this is really important, 160 organisations together to try and come up with a manifesto that could appeal to as broad a uh, number of people as, as possible. Now, I don't know what it's like for you here in Lismore, but I know from my experience in, in Mullumbimby that it's almost impossible to get agreement with three people around the table, you know, and we're, everybody's got their own, their own points and, and arguments. But what's particularly clear about um, the case in Canada is that Naomi Klein, under her watch really, she was able to get 160 organisations and untold number of uh, independent activists to agree on this manifesto. It was a startling achievement. And actually, and I've got to say that the challenge for the progressive left is not to tear ourselves to pieces with petty arguments over ideological points. It is. It is to seek the points of agreement, not the points, uh, not to win an argument. The, the stakes are too high currently for that. We have, to, we have to acknowledge, appreciate and respect that people come from a whole variety of different views. And this is what Naomi Klein actually managed to achieve. And it's a startling doc document. It shook the Canadian government to its very foundations. Um, and it got an incredibly massive backlash from the usual suspects, not, not least the CEOs of corporations. But these are some of the things they suggested. It's a bit of a shopping list, but I'll just read a few of them out. Respect the rights of First Nations. End fossil fuel extraction and subsidies. Promote localised energy democracy. Advance local ecologically based agricultural systems. Yeah. Yeah. End all destructive trade deals, particularly TPP. That's not the only one, there are many of them. Yeah. Welcome refugees. Yeah. Ensure full protection for all workers. Expand care caregiving jobs, which is one of Naomi Klein's um, favourite sort of demands. Introduce the universal basic income. Yeah. Introduce a financial transaction act. Make the companies pay, especially the financial companies, for the, for the billions and trillions of dollars that they make through their transactions. Increase taxes on corporations and the wealthy. And believe it or not, the money won't fly out of the country. You know, in the United States, this is very interesting, that uh, under the uh, I can't remember which admi US administration, the, ink, the, the tax the tax rate for the top companies was in the order of 70% for a period of about 50 years. The American common economy didn't collapse, it actually strengthened and the money was distributed around the population and, and consumption increased as a result. Um, not that I'm pushing for consumption necessarily. Cut military spending take corp and take corporate money out of our political campaigns. That, that should be um, the the leading demand that we make because that's the way the corporations and the powerful rich and powerful get their way in this country by actually buying off politicians the other organization I want to draw your attention to is Australia remade um, this also is a remarkable achievement for the same reasons as the um, the um, leap manifesto the project was called the Engagement Project, organised again by a bunch of activists and I think this is the most remarkable achievement and, and it's really gripped the imagination of a lot of people around Australia. It's been supported by Oxfam, by GetUp and by some of the leading environmental organisations in Australia. And they've come up with nine pillars. I won't explain them all but you'll get the gist when I read them out. The nine pillars of a better society and the way they came to this, these pillars was by actually talking to about 250 people from a variety of different backgrounds. And they asked them, basically, what would you like to see in a better Australia? What would make Australia a better place? What are the, what are the fundamental foundations for a better country, a country that we can be proud of? One was, the first was, a first people's heart, acknowledging indigenous wisdoms, weaving through indigenous knowledge through every aspect of our lives, yeah. giving indigenous people the recognition they deserve if it's through a treaty or whatever means possible, respecting them in the national political process, not setting up an assembly and then dismissing it in the most insulting way possible, um, and respecting their adherence to the land and to their traditions and song lines and so forth. The second, a natural world for now and the future that we that we acknowledge the importance 
and our deep interconnections with the world of nature yeah. that we are part of that world we are we and trees we need each other mm -hmm. we're in a complex relationship <laughs> is ken in this room ken where's ken yeah. ken what did you say the other day ken your fantastic talk that i attended brilliant talk where ken pointed out to me he said that how's it go the trees release Oh, that was, that was, that was. I can't remember. <coughs> Trees release yeah, oxygen. oxygen yeah, we 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 spew out carbon carbon dioxide, and they breathe it in. Yeah. So look, there's an independence. Um, trees have a life. They're, they're not that different to us. Um, it took me ten years to try to begin to understand that, but but I think there's a lot of truth to it. Um, thirdly, an economy for all the people. Yeah. That means that we have systems of taxation and financial arrangements that ensure that people at the bottom of the socio-economic pile are not, not left bereft and, and marginalised. I heard today two million people are on or below the poverty line in, in Australia, one of the mo richest countries on earth. Three million. Three million. I beg your pardon. Sorry, that, that million. You, know, you can forget about it. But you know, uh, eight point five percent, Richard. Eight point five percent. Thank you very much for the correction. Um, that also, um, food insecurity is on the rise. People can't afford to live in, in high rental homes. Um, people, the the debts, the level of debt is astronomic in Australia. Probably the highest level of debt per capita in the world. Yeah. The fourth pillar that they suggest, a society where all contributions count and every job has dignity. The fifth one, a diversity of people living side by side, not dividing people, not wedging people, not using the race card, not adhering to the policies of Pauline Hanson, um, not, not being happy simply to see people of a different color, uh, skin colour rotting away on prison islands indefinitely. Imagine if they were white people. Imagine that. Imagine if they came from Canada or America. This never would have happened. Sixthly, a country of flourishing communities, of reconnected communities, yeah. neighbourhoods. Where we, where we, one, one of the most radical things you can actually do is, is actually get to know your neighbours. Get talking to your neighbours. Build relationships. Don't be fearful. Don't sit near houses. Seventhly, a new dawn for women. A, a society in which women are respected, in which the no-brainer, I mean, why, the no of, of actually paying women and women differently is, is just a total no-brainer. This should not be the case in the um, 21st century. A, a land where there are opportunities for women, where they make up, you know, the, um, more and more CEO positions, for example, or more managers, that they figure it more as vice chancellors in our universities, and, and more women in senior management positions, that they're not, they're not marginalised in the way they continue to be. Then that there's a thriving democracy, not a democracy that's been bought off by the corporations. And finally, a proud contribution to a just world, and that means paying our fair share of foreign aid, mm -hmm. adhering to the international protocols, returning to the world international order by adhering to those UN charters and, and conventions, particularly the, um, the Charter for, Refu uh, for, for Refugees. We, we want to be proud. We want to be proud Australians. That doesn't mean waving a, a flag with the Union Jack on it. What it means is adhering to values and principles that we all hold dear at least in this room. <laughs> okay, finally, it's too hot to speak. Um, finally, I've five points to make, very brief. Um, we all have our spheres of influence. There's, there are things each of us can actually do to make the world a better place. Um, I often talk about the, the social movements of which we're a part. You know, there's, there are the grand visions of being at the forefront of social movements and confronting governments and politicians. But the person next door who chooses to use a, a sort of environmentally sustainable washing up liquid might also be part of that movement. Somebody who decides to eat decent food, if they can afford it, um, might be making a statement. Somebody who chooses to have less waste somebody who chooses to grow their own vegetables. These are part of the social movement too, as much as the grand oppositional movements. The first point I'm going to make is this. I'm going to, I want, I'd like to see revitalise that famous second wave feminist mantra, the personal is political, yeah. because it really is. How we engage with ourselves, 
how we look after ourselves, and that is important. Self-care is, is a political project these days. If you look at the rates of obesity and, and the rest of it, it's a, it's a major issue. But engaging with ourselves and with others is of critical importance. We can't simply talk on the basis of abstract principle. We have to live lives which are engaged with other people in the world as it is. But we can change that world, as Joanna Macy and many others say, by altering the way we behave and act with ourselves and the relationship we have with others. Secondly, the importance of building relationships. This is something I bang on about all the time and most people ignore. That's all right. <laughs> people who ignore most of my stuff. But relationship building is critical to, to developing a global social movement. It is no use arguing that if we topple the existing power arrangements, and if we topple the banks, and if we topple the governments, we get rid of the lobby, that somehow the world's going to turn out to be a lovely place. There are plenty of examples where that's happened, where the very opposite happened. Because in the working out of relationships, and look, somebody actually, I heard somebody say yesterday on, on the radio how listening was an incredibly important political activity, just listening, engaging with people. Even with people you don't agree with, engage in arguments and conversations. Don't insult them, don't put them down. Find, about, find out about the realities of their everyday lives, the stresses, the strains, their hopes, the aspirations they're under. That's the way to win people over, not by berating them with ideology. Thirdly, live a localized life. Live a localized life, live a smaller life, live a simpler life. Um, says he, he's just going back to go on, con uh, on holiday to Canada. Okay, <laughs> I'm not perfect, but try, aspire to do that. I mean, I try to do the best way I can. I'm really clumsy, I'm hopeless, I generate, you know, I, I do things I shouldn't do, I know that, I'm, I'm, I, and I'm racked with guilt about it at times. <laughs> but um, look, in, in all these communities, particularly on the northern rivers, there are wonderful examples of a life that should be lived. What we're seeing in Mullumbimby, Lismore, Nimbin, um, where else, Bangalore, Byron, are glimpses of a potentially different future. The farmer's market in Mullumbimby is one of the greatest examples of that. They sell organic food, you go there on the Friday, you sit around, you talk, you natter, you, you talk about politics, you argue, you disagree, then you might go buy some food, you have a coffee. The interesting thing about farmer's markets is that um, sociologists in the United States who've studied this stuff have pointed out that there is 80% more interaction in farmers markets than there is in the supermarket. Supermarkets are designed to be explicitly about consumption and nothing else. Whereas farmers markets, much to the, uh, sh the chagrin of uh, CEOs and corporations and, and the capitalists quaking their boots, is about social connection and it's about eating well and it's about sharing and caring and being part of a local culture. The fourth thing, and this is important, we are, look, the idea, uh, I would argue, I would argue that if we look after ourselves, if we engage with others, that kind of, if we, you know, go to the farmer's market, that's all well and good. If we can create ways of living that contribute to rendering the dominant system obsolete, or parts of it, fantastic, I'm all for it. But, but, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever, and maybe this is the inner lapsed Marxist in me, but there will be flashpoints. There were, the corporations will not roll over. Um, they, the, the CEOs are there to stay. Look, we have corporations and CEOs, ExxonMobil being the prime example of a company that knows full well about the consequences of climate change. And the, the research was done under the watch of Rex Tillerson. They know entirely that climate change is a real existential threat and yet they will proceed with their activities. Mm -hmm. Just as in Australia, gov governments of both sides actually, but more so on the liberal side of politics, they say they believe in climate change. <coughs> but they have an energy mix which is now dissipated, which had coal into the foreseeable future. The Premier of Queensland is overseeing uh, the biggest construction, the biggest coal mine no. in the southern hemisphere I understand. So. The flashpoints will occur. If Adani happens, we all have to get on buses. We have to go. I'm the biggest coward in the world. I will go to Adani <laughs> and I am prepared to get arrested because this is, this is not just causing problems to, you know, to all of us, 
But the coal that's been exported to India, my friend Gideon Pollier, a emeritus professor in biology who does the maths on this stuff, has estimated that annually, as a result of the exporting of coal, that up to 13 to 14,000 people will die from ambient air pollution. Never mind the contribution it's making collectively to a rising tide of carbon emissions around the world as we speak. And contrary to what Tony Abbott said, carbon emissions can be measured in tonnage. The most important thing, I think, when we talk to people individually, in our communities, our neighbours, uh, our friends, our family members, anybody, is treat them with respect, treat them with kindness, listen to their stories, listen to their challenges, but put the alternative story that life really doesn't have to be this way. Mm. And it's this way because of the particular power arrangements in our society, the financial arrangements, the economic arrangements, and they're the, they're the dots that have to be joined and, and it's the big picture that we need to look at. On a final word is this. Gandhi, the great Indian leader, in his resistance movement to the English, when he was reflecting one day, said, the future demands, sorry, the future depends on what we do in the present. It does. That seems obvious. Anandati Roy, another Indian activist, and a wonderful writer, a thoughtful writer, has said this, and it's something you're, it's a quote you're familiar with. Another world is not only possible, she is on its way, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. Hear her. And so can I. Thank you. Well, thanks, Richard. I think that was fantastic talk. Covered everything, as he does. And so we'd like to open the floor up for questions and answers. You'd have to stand up and shout. And uh, Richard will do his best to answer you. So let's take this gentleman here first. Uh, I'm going to ask you what the most important activist activity we could do. I, I have no list. Um, you all have your own recommendations. I've got two things. Um, one is we should all be literate. We should all find out about how this system operates and how it works. Um, I have a lot of work to do in terms of understanding the finance system, um, but um, I think we need to understand that. We need to understand the connection between structural arrangements and individual experience. I think that's really important, so kind of economic literacy is important. I think the second thing we can do is, uh, you know, I wrote two books about universities, right? And I used to go to these, these book launches, and, um, and there's all academics used to turn up, like hundreds of them, you know. And the only reason they turned up is because I was saying what they were feeling. And they, they'd often ask me, Richard, what can we do? And I, you know, I was tempted to say, well, storm the barricade. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, get the, get the dean and drag him around the street. You know, well, I don't know. You know. And, uh, but actually what I said is, I, my first question is, I said, do you have a morning tea? And, and you know what the interesting thing? In the neoliberal university, one of the first things, two things to go very quickly are the morning tea and the staff common room. That's two things, and, uh, and I kid you not, uh, one of the questions I asked uh, Yvonne today, or was it Sandy, I can't remember, uh, I said, uh, do you still have morning teas? And much to my amazement, they do. Or they have afternoon drinks. Once you build a human connection with another person, even in the most mundane way, uh, once you have those rituals getting together, um, that's the foundation for talking about common experience. You then talk about your common complaints. You then might talk about how you can act on those complaints. You then might talk about the role of the trade union. And look, trade union membership is rock bottom. Uh, and the reason it's rock bottom, it's been trashed by the government and there's legislation in place to ensure they can't operate properly in, in the way they want to. But we have the remarkable, wonderful Sally McManus, who is speaking out against neoliberalism but more importantly, she's getting people conversing with each other. Um, one of the best books I've read in the last 12 months was by a guy called, uh, I've forgotten his name. The book is um, How to Resist. And this is a guy that head up, headed up the UK citizens movement. And the, how the movement started, what the movement was about, was getting cleaners in the public and private services to talk with each other. Now the reason this resonated with me was because my mother was a cleaner in a hospital in Coventry in the Midlands. 
And as a result of her experiences, she lost a lot of her health. She worked in a cancer ward, actually. Um, but those people got, he got those people to talk with each other. He built relationships with them. Respectful relationships with them. He got them to talk with each other. They built, built up a huge movement <coughs> that actually founded the movement for a living wage in England. And they got it passed by Parliament in the end. That is the power. Never underestimate the power of connection between two people. But the thing is to build on that as much as you can do. So if you're in a workplace where you don't have tea breaks, have a tea break and start the conversations to create common purpose, common understanding and hopefully common action in the end. The worst thing you can do is be on your own. If you're on your own, you're a sitting duck. You're not going to achieve anything. But through the union, through collective action, I think a lot can be achieved. Yeah, it's what we do about this uh, terrible sort of dichotomy, this, this contradiction between an absolute commitment to human rights and the possibility of a communitarian community. Well, my first response to that would be, don't believe anything comes out of the United States. Because uh, the United States are responsible, it's estimated, for over 72 million deaths since the end of the Second World War, um, directly or indirectly. Um, so when the United States talks about human rights, well, I, I don't particularly listen to them. Um, what I look at are the, the actual effects of their power. And um, I think that human rights are critically important. Um, they are the bedrock of any decent society. Um, I'm happy to see that we're pursuing uh, an agenda in Malambimbi, uh, as, almost as we speak, um, to promote um, the whole question of rights. I think they have to be legislated, but I think they can only be legislated in a society that's based on equity and social justice. And without that, they're almost meaningless. Like the Americans talk constantly about human rights, and yet they're in the order of, I don't know how many tens of millions of people who are in deep poverty in the United States with not enough food to eat, they haven't got a decent health service, so on and so forth. So I wouldn't listen too much to what comes out of the United States. What we have to concentrate on in this country is building communities, contributing to those to the social movements that, that we're all part of and to ensuring that we keep, um, we keep the, the powerful in check and we ensure we, we do our best to ensure that even within the, the framework of liberal democracy that we get leaders who somehow are going to represent the views of, of, of ordinary people which most of them don't unfortunately. That doesn't answer your question. <coughs> you, you just said a while ago that if, if Adani goes ahead you're going to hop on a bus and go up. Now, is it then too late? Mm. Nagara was honoured to honour the um, uh, indigenous people of the Adani's um, coal basin area, the Galilee Basin, and what they specifically said, and I admitted it six or nine months ago now, was please don't go up there. Please, it's their land and they don't know how to look after you and they feel that they are obliged to look after uh, people who come on their land properly. But go to your capital cities, go to your regional um, cities and, you know, just don't let up with constant presence and constant argument and constant noise. There's a lot of coal mines in New South Wales right now that yeah. you could get on a bus to and you could form your own blockade right now because they're mining the crap out of New South Wales. Wales yeah, right no, now. Yeah. We don't need done. to wait for Adani, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I did say that in Hunter Valley. There's 11 coal mines, expans, expansions of coal mines in New South Wales that together yeah. are bigger than yeah. Adani yeah. in terms of emissions, yeah. in terms of water, in terms yeah. of land use. Yeah. So New South Wales is exporting climate change to yeah. the world through the world's biggest coal port, mm -hmm. plus a massive uh, gas expansion in the northwest, mm -hmm. the Narrabri Gas Project. So we have this golden opportunity. There's an election coming, hooray! Yeah. Yeah. And we get to make coal and gas a hot election issue. We can all get involved. There's a time to choose campaign, which is a lock the gate campaign and from gas or free northern rivers. So let's make it a hot election issue. We can change this. And if you really want, you can vote What would be at least one if not three efficacious ways to effectively tax wealth. I will defer to my learned colleague over here on these matters. I'm not an economist, but hey, you know, 
Liz, your chance. International corporations can stop writing off their gains as, you know, being actually losses. So, and tax havens must be banned internationally. Yeah, yeah. That would be a great start yeah, and one the Australian population already really get behind, even Bill Shorten saying that, you know, we have to <laughs> tax the corporations. <laughs> Secondly, the international finance industry needs a, uh, a, a small tax on it. It used to be called the Tobin tax and that'll slow this very scary derivative um, load, loading that we've got that actually is threatening our entire financial system and lastly we've got to um, change a lot of our we probably need a universal basic income and a much more flat tax way of doing things at the lower levels of income and a much steeper curve for the higher incomes I mean the, the, the Labor Party, to their credit, made the first $18,000 of your earnings tax-free, a thing that yes. Murdoch never yes. mentioned, yes. Um, but it's been a wonderful thing. So that threshold can be raised, and then we can have a lot more taxes actually on consumption and not work. I think work's sacred, and if people have part-time, dignified work, with re moderate incomes, they shouldn't be taxed very much. Taxation should be on resource use. Oh, supplementary question. <laughs> Tax on okay. wealth, assets. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll work this one out. <laughs> Anyway, we need both international and national taxes, and it is a huge way of um, improving the situation. <coughs> and I do believe the Labor Party will be saying that for the next election. You tax big corporations in order to um, support hospitals and schools. It's like the Liberal Party, this thing. <laughs> <laughs> it never works. <laughs> but uh, d just to say that um, the. Um, a friend of mine who, who crunches the numbers on these things, and Liz, you might correct me on this, but I asked him how much are the top corporations not paying in tax annually? <laughs> yes. And he puts the figure around 500 to 750 billion dollars yeah. a year. Yeah. 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 Now, I don't know about you, but I reckon you could build a shitload of hospitals and schools <laughs> and the rest of it. So this is not only not paying tax, we need to reframe the argument and say this is theft from the public purse. Yeah. That's what it is. Last you know? financial year, one in three of our major corporations <laughs> paid zero tax. Yeah. That's one in three, last financial year, zero tax. That's where your billions is coming That's from. Right. That's right. Just to put it in context, our total GDP, which is a phony measure, I agree, is about 1.6 trillion. Mm. So That's that right. number of billions is, you know, maybe a third or... Yeah, a, precisely. 40%. In my book, it, I, I reckon about 60 or 70% of our efforts, resources and emissions are going up in smoke or off to tax havens or to a very tiny elite. So there's masses of money available for the good and masses of money for less hours of work and masses of money for a UBI, which is just going to be pissed up the wall. As Stanley McManus said, we've been ripped off. One of the things I think we really need to do is to be focusing on changing the culture of the country. We really need to change the culture. It is quite legal for, at the moment for these uh, corporations to pay no tax. It's quite legal for them to shift around all over the place. But the, it's totally unethical. And it's the culture that we need to, to work on to change. We need to start talking to these CEOs about what are you going to do about your grandchildren when they're struggling to survive in the world that you've created for your own personal pocket full of gold. Can, can I just we, add to that? that yep. New, New Start hasn't been increased for how many years? 20 years. Yeah. Um, the minister, the relevant, the relevant minister was asked, could he survive on $35 yeah. a day? And he didn't answer the question. Yeah. But they, they get money, which is actually under the poverty line. Yeah. I yeah. mean, and, and people think that's acceptable. You know? Even John Howard thinks it should be raised. I know, I know. I know. The Business <laughs> Council of Australia thinks it should be raised. I used to work with the Department of Agriculture, and for a while I worked in head office. And I was horrified about the fact that people didn't talk to each other. And the reason for it, I spoke to various people around, that the building was designed to minimise the connection between people because the people who designed it felt that people chatting were wasting time, <laughs> they should be sitting there. And yet the Department of Agriculture is based on information exchange and development and yet we're not allowed to talk to each other. And that's a classic example of the sort of society that 
neoliberalism has built. Uh, I'd like to return to the Montparnasse Society. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, is it true it's the premier economic <coughs> warfare unit of the British Crown? Sorry? Is it true that it's the premier <coughs> economic <coughs> warfare unit of the British Crown? Yes. Well, some people argue that. What, what I did. Is it true that the primary goal is to infiltrate and dismantle nation states? Yes. Is that true, sir? Well, two answers to that. Two answers is um, 39 people attended that meeting in 1947. As I say, von Hayek, Friedman, uh, Karl Popper, uh, and, and the rest. Mainly business leaders, some politicians, a lot of economists. Sure, and speculators. Uh, and, and what they look, I'm not, I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of conspiracy theories. However, what I will say is that that there were a group of people who were intent and backed up by billionaire dollars right. on um, ensuring that free market e economics rolled back Keynesianism. Right. Um, well, my question is really bringing it into the modern day sure. and asking you, is it true that Sir Roger Douglas from the New Zealand experiment was a member of the Mont Ireland Society? Was it true that Peter Costello, the Treasurer of Australia, was a member of a fully fledged member of the Mont Perilin Society. Those are questions I'd like to know if you I don't think believe that's that. true. Some of the, uh, what I do know is that it has attracted uh, various nefarious figures from the the right, uh, not not necessarily the far right, but you know liberal party individuals. The, if you read Jane Mayer's book, the intention of, of this was, I, I keep saying this, we, we have to if we want to become literate about neoliberalism, you have to understand its history. Well, and and so, so, let, let me just say this. 1947, with all the bankers, speculators, and all the that's money right, that's right. They decided, let's go free market. Uh, I understand that. I'm, I'm trying to bring it a little bit more forward. And I'd also just like to remind you that Paul Bremer yep. was Donald Rumsfeld man. Yes. 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 I know. Thank you for the other. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, no, I agree. No, no, there's no argument. I, I agree with what you say. I, I don't. I don't have got the specific answer to your question, but what I do know is that the billionaire dollars went into various things. They funded 800 right-wing foundations, they funded think tanks, they funded university professorial positions, they funded activist organisations, they funded the Tea Party, uh, which arguably has a connection to the corporate coup d'etat that was Donald Trump, although uh, those years later. But, but they, and the Koch brothers in particular, but not, not solely, they are the key instigators of the emergence of neoliberalism. We have to understand that. Yeah. Richard, it's a fantastic presentation. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely it was. Yeah, no. Thank you, mate. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is, how do we convince members uh, and also elected representatives of large political parties to turn down political donations when those donations are the things that continue to be have them elected? Except for the Greens. Of course. <laughs> Who accept no corporate donations? Not even small business. No, that's Say right. that louder, Sue. Um, just reminding everybody, the Greens are the only political party in the real races that accept no donations whatsoever from corporations or businesses and only accept donations from individuals like you. Just letting you know, I'm running for the state seat of Lismore. <laughs> and, hey, wow. and, 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 and can I just plug, for those that aren't yet a part of it, we're having a hellishly exciting time in Lismore right now, trying to turn this place green. And for those that don't know the cunning plan, if we can retain Ballina, win Lismore in the next state election, and we do retain our two safe seats in the Metropolitan, so Newtown and Balmain, there is a chance we could take the balance of power in New South Wales, and we could seriously get some work done. We could get some real work done in New South Wales on climate and social justice and the things that we are all talking about tonight. Um, so I actually think that we will... Stand up. <laughs> standing up. I actually think we will reach that place of critical mass where being a politician actually comes... It becomes integrity-based, cool and trendy 
to run on your representation of integrity of the grassroots, it's going to become uncool very soon. If we can get that status quo and we can topple that monopoly where it's okay to be bought and people know you're for sale, the minute they know you're not for sale and you can't be bought, that's when people will want that person. And right now, with all the love and respect I have to my colleagues in my race, lovely young Austin Curtin, lovely Janelle Safin, unfortunately they can be bought and they are for sale, but we're just not. And it's a hard gig, but we've got to make that the cool proposition for you and me and then for all the other people out there. Cleaning up politics is something right now all people want to do. So we've just got to help people understand what that looks like. And it does mean people standing up without that party machine behind them. And it's a hard thing to do, but it takes people power. And at the end of the day, we will win because there is all of this literature about the very things that need to change and it keeps trumping the argument. One of the things we most need to change is corporate donations to political parties. We've just got to stop it. It took Hayek about 40 years and Friedman for their vision of, yes. of neoliberalism to actually start to take root um, because social democracy was so entrenched and was so good for the people after World War II for rebuilding all of the nations. I think that we have to be patient and I think Aidan, who spoke from Southern Cross University, he's an activist professor, he spoke about incrementalism. Mm. So I thought a good take, take home from tonight mm. might be that it's okay to be incremental in our slow gains and content in a way with just throwing pebbles in the pond and watching them spreading out slowly because if you're after rapid change, it just ain't gonna happen. I think incrementalism is a very important take can, can I just, yeah. <coughs> can I just add to that? Uh, I, if I could just add to that, that um, we need to create what Antonio Gramsci, the famous Marxist um, theoretician, talked about in terms of common sense um, or hegemony, and there's a spin-off from that, but the, the, the idea, one of the reasons why neoliberalism took off and why people bought into it, um, and it's, we need to know this, is because they had something to sell and it was persuasive. They used the language which seemed very moderate. They talked about choice, about freedom, about liberty. Now, given people, well, try and understand this. They met in 1947. They had just come out of a war involving a totalitarian, two totalitarian powers. They saw the, the results of Stalinism uh, in Russia with the gulags and the rest. And these people were not monstrous. They believed morally and ethically what they were doing is unleashing freedom, giving people the freedom to compete with each other. It sounded very persuasive. We have to understand that. Mm -hmm. but, but the consequences of what's occurred, particularly in terms of favouring the, the rich and the powerful, more recently the corporations, have been catastrophic for us and the planet. I think it's about balance. Capitalism's got some great features, especially when it's small and well regulated. And the state has some marvellous features hmm. when it's in balance and, and has plenty of accountability. So it's not all one or all the other. That's the problem with the neoliberal discourse. They're always saying, oh, the only way forward is, you know, choice or something. No, I, I, so I, would, I would argue with that. I mean, um, I, I, I'm actually opposed to capitalism as a system and as a worldview and as a practice. There, there is room for small it's business, of course yucky. there is. There is room for medium-sized business, of course there yeah, is. Okay. But That's the capitalist e ethos and the way it's been totally bastardised, if you go back to, like Noam Chomsky makes his point, you go back to the Wealth of Nations by, by Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. Adam Smith recognised mm -hmm. the perils of the free market and if you unleash a particular version of capitalism on the population, <laughs> he, he knew there'd be greed, he knew that people would miss out, he knew there'd be massive inequality. It's all there in his book and Noam Chomsky makes that point ad nauseum. So it's not, it's what we actually need to do is actually <coughs> revisit the idea I think of the commons and the commonwealth, yeah. 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 Uh, the, the values yeah, yeah. of sharing, caring, cooperation and collaboration and let's come up with a different word. I mean let's not, socialism, I don't know, uh, yeah. but other words uh, that, that might be more appropriate and to ensure that people, that there is a place for people with small business. I'm not talking about a, a centralised command economy as the Soviet time, not at all. I recognise <laughs> businesses need, need to operate, but what I'm saying, they need to do within a, in a framework of equity and social 
justice, and that's the key. That's why we love you, Richard. Um, what I'm saying is, I became a conscientious objector, and um, and and uh, there, back back in the 60s, there when the war was on, the Vietnam War, there was a, a massive movement. And that's what we've got to bring about. We've got to bring about, we can do all this talking, and it's important to talk about this, but we have to, to act, we can act as, as a mass together. Act within the law and peacefully. And, and that's the only thing that the government will eventually listen to. If you, we, it's important, yes, to get the politicians in, into parliament, but I don't have any faith in the uh, political system as it is at the moment. It's mm. just a whole lot of freaking bullshit. <laughs> and, yeah. and so, we, the, the, the first thing is that we've got to create a big movement in Lismore and all the towns around. We've got to connect with each other. But we need, we can talk at these groups, we need also to talk at a, at a personal level within small groups. Mm. And I advocate that we should be forming a number of groups in, in, within Lismore, within all the towns around, and we need to communicate with those towns too, and as to what sort of practical actions we can uh, take to bring this enormous change that we, we have to. Because I think we've now reached a point where if we don't do something in the next few years, we're going to face terrible, terrible situation. I've got a daughter in Sydney, she's got one child, two year old, and now she's become sure. pregnant. Look, I, I understand. I understand your concern for your children, and grandchildren. I understand that. Let me just say this: that how many people are there in this room? How many people? Hundred, hundred and something. I mean, why did you come out? Why did you come out to listen to some guy? I mean, you came out because there was a conversation occurring around a set of ideas, and and you're participants in those ideas. You will go back to your homes and to your communities, your yeah. neighbourhoods. You will have conversations with other people. Yeah. You need to enliven those conversations, keep them alive. This is I don't I can't remember the, who said this, but you know, never underestimate the capacity of a small group of people to change the world. They can, they can, and um, and they do repeatedly. Look, you are part of if you adhere broadly to the values we've talked about today, you are part of a global movement. <laughs> and, and those global movements spread through conversations and the sharing of ideas. And, and that's, that, that's the point. That's the point to this. So I've recently been to a collab in Byron that was about VR experiences and... That was recently about VR experiences and I think that vir sorry, virtual reality experiences. So my question to you, well, whilst we're talking economy and loneliness, is that A, um, I do believe that some of the systems that have been in place in regards to neoliberalism have uh, forced these technologies to be exponential. But what do you think? Are they beneficial or scary in regards to issues of loneliness, not only for young people, i.e. gaming, but gaming, but old people, i.e. Um, say being looked after by robots? All I can say to you is this, um, is I'm very interested in the question of social disconnection. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say to you that all technology is bad, isn't it terrible, we shouldn't be on the computers, we're all on computers, we're all on, we've all got our, our mobile phones, we're, this is part of our culture now, it's hard to see it changing dramatically. Um, has it had positive effects? Yes, it has. Um, ha it's enabled communities and people to talk to each other uh, from around the world. Um, that has had its benefits, educationally and on other fronts. Does it have its dark sides? Absolutely it does, and not least with young people. The evidence now is out there. I'm reading a book currently called How Social Media is Ruining Your Life. And, and it's about the excessive use of social media and when people, young people, immerse themselves in this stuff, what they forget to do is to talk to people face to face. And, and, the, and the, one of the consequences of that is a diminished capacity to engage in conversation to, and, and to empathise. So what the corollary of that is that people live in disconnect, increasingly disconnected ways. Hugh McKay, you should all read Hugh McKay's book, it's brilliant. Um, it's called Australia Reimagined, and he discusses in detail 
the implications of this kind of technology for, for many, many people. Not for all, um, but the, the consequences are real. And look, the other thing, um, I hope I could share this. Yeah, I, I wrote a really embarrassing letter for the Echo, um, which was published um, yesterday. And Mandy Nolan, who I greatly respect, our fantastic local comedian. Saint Nolan. Saint Nolan, I beg your pardon, Saint Nolan. Um, she, she was writing um, on men Mental Health Week or Mental Health Day. And she was talking about the way in which people with mental health problems are marginalised or stigmatised in communities. And she said the important thing is that communities should embrace these people and they shouldn't be on the margins. They should, we should engage with them. Now, what immediately came to my mind, having immersed myself in literature, not least a book by Johan Hari called Lost Connections, was that we live in a culture propped up by neoliberalism in which the dominant message is look after yourself, um, compete. Um, increasingly, one in three people live uh, alone in Australia. People living in families often are strangers to each other because of, because of the new, these technologies. There is a real danger of these technologies. Other people, there are other people, I know a couple of people in this room, who argue very forcefully that the way to the future is by using super machines and by creating robots to take the drudgery out of work. Um, I see possibilities in some of that. I think my view, personal view, is every single technology that's invented needs to be subject to an ethics test. Every single technology needs to be subjected to a test of whether it contributes to social well-being or not. And if it doesn't, then we need to have some serious consideration around that. But simply to accept new, new technologies as if they're not dangerous seems to me very fool, foolish. One of, one of the greatest boons of social media and the internet has been for corporations, for advertising, for promotion of online business and communication and trade and financial exchanges. So it's, I think we need to be really measured in terms of how we engage with these technologies. They're not necessarily all bad, they're not, not necessarily all good. That's as far as I'll go. Have you looked into, um, and can you recommend any um, altern democratic alternatives to representative democracies we know that can possibly work in conjunction with or separate to each other? Well, I can't, I, I can't recommend an ideal type. What I can say to you is that there are countries on this planet who are amongst the most wealthy who have sophisticated welfare systems, who look after their poorest, and their most needy. It's about make, ensuring that, that we, we, we keep exposing the machinations of corporations, the military elites, the economic elites, and what the consequences of their actions are. And those are plain, those are plain. The woman in Fallujah um, is bearing the consequences, not simply of an empire war, but of the rapaciousness of American corporations. Yeah. But we look at the we look at the large wave that's surrounding us within India and China, the massive amounts of uh, population. That's we're going to find the consequences of that, not so much the sense of conversation within a pub in Lismore. Mm. <laughs> so what would be your response to that? Well, no, I was just wondering what you said. My response to that, I'm an old lefty from the 70s, mate. Sure, sure, I believe sure. in the international, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Um, no, I'm asking you, where do you see that? Where do you see the education of the masses from well, that of the... Um... That, that, that's not a language I would use. Um, I, I think that... Um, let me just give you an example. In, I, was a, I was a student, I was a member of the, of, uh, the International Marxist Group in the 1970s. I was a student committed to the overthrow of capitalism. Now, I believed in revolution. I, be I believed in all that and until, until I had a conversation with my colleagues about what would happen in the post-revolutionary scenario. <laughs> and I found out who they'd lock up and who they'd torture and who they'd imprison. So I had real serious concerns about that. I, I went to university, I went to university and I heard Arthur Scargill, the former president of the Miners' Union, yeah standing up, raging to, to the students about uh, the Thatcher government and promising us, as night follows day, that there would be a revolution in the following year. He got beaten by the organised power of the state. That's what we got beaten by. When I talk about Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, I support these guys. I don't think they're perfect. I think they've got some great policies. I think they're flawed in other ways, particularly Bernie Sanders. But what I would say is this, is that if they ever get a slice of the pie in terms of the election, 
watch out yeah. because what they're going to have to do is confront capital in all its power. Mm -hmm. They're not going to roll over, they're going to ensure through the corporate media that they will not succeed. So it's not just a case of winning an election, it's then we've seen governments on radical platforms, the Five Star Movement, look what's happened to them uh, of late. <laughs> What we have to do is ensure, not simply that we get people into power, but there's a transition process to ensure that the key institutions underpinning um, um, a democratic society are somehow put in place. It's a, it's a massive challenge. They're corrupt. It's a massive challenge. Yeah, of course they are corrupt, and they're extremely powerful. It's not easy. I, I do think, though, just coming back to Michael's point about incrementalism, it took neoliberalism 60 years to get to where it is. Yeah. It might take us. 60, 100 years. It might. It's a long struggle. It's not going to happen overnight. The, the pressure cooker, the pressure cooker situation in all this is climate change. Because if we don't act on climate change, there will be no future. There will be no governments, you know. So, so the question for me, and to answer you, is how do we organise around, around the issue of climate change to ensure that we actually survive? So climate change is an opportunity then? Yes, of course it is. Of course it is. <laughs> about what's going wrong and I think it's really important to share a book which is about how to do things mm -hmm. because there's a body of knowledge about mm -hmm. how social movements work yes. we won a gas for free northern rivers Yay! based on that body of knowledge you know so but it's a body of knowledge that keeps getting lost mm -hmm. you know so we forever, forever have this amnesia that there actually is a body of knowledge mm -hmm. yeah. and a most fantastic book came out last year called this is an uprising by Engler and Engler yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, that, I, I really like that statement from a gentleman in the middle here that we do need a big powerful social movement it mm -hmm. is urgent of course. and and uh, and so I encourage everybody to read that book because we need that knowledge uh, and it's there and uh, by the way if anybody is interested in stopping the coal madness and the gas madness in New South Wales and the time to choose campaign uh, go to Maddie talk Yay. to me who else is here who can yep. get their names mm -hmm. Yep, so uh, get involved. Go have a frappuccino. It's a happening <laughs> frappuccino. <laughs> it's time to choose. It's a massive no opportunity. Doubt. It's time to choose now. Can, can, I, can I just respond very briefly to the question? Yeah. I, I fully agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Fully agree. I haven't forgotten. <laughs> I haven't forgotten about that. I, I, I've mentioned some of the texts. Yeah. There is a body of literature on social movements. Yeah. But I think it's important not to see social movements out there. Yeah. This is part of the social movement. We are, movement. It. We are yeah, part yeah. of the social yeah, movement. Okay. We are part of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. And I'm getting tired now. And I yeah. need Hey. I think let's, we need to finish it there because 10 to 9 and...